Performance Formula podcast. It's so awesome having you here. Um, oh, thank you so much, George. Thank you so, yeah. so much for for inviting me. Um, and yeah, man, congrats on your past podcasts and all the great things you've been doing with them. Um, you know, come a long, long way. No, I, I appreciate that. I think I think you're most probably my guest I've known the best. Uh, uh, there's maybe one or two others, but I, I would imagine from a performance point of view and from a cricket point yeah. of view, you, you're definitely somebody that we together we've walked a long path, right? And so it's, I'm, I'm just oh, excited yes. for where the next sort of hour is going to take us. And <laughs> How many years has it been actually? Been like since what, 16, 12 years maybe? Yeah, maybe something like that. Years? 10, 10 to 12 years. years. Yeah. It's been a, oh, it's, been, it's been a journey, eh? It's been a journey. Yeah, no, it's been a, oh, it's been so special. And I remember us having chats on the bank there at Wanderers on the, on the grass embankment. This was, this must have been like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, yeah. yeah. From yeah, that office, to go to, to Marshall yeah, Bay. Yeah, the office you know? has changed a couple of times, eh? Oh, yeah. Scenic views from the Wanderers Cricket Stadium all the way down to that little chair there. In Mossel mm. Bay, with that beautiful view Amazing. across the ocean, right, and and any, oh, any, yeah. and a lot of places in between. So, yeah. Oh man, no, very special, very special. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, I, I think what I want to try and get out of this conversation is that when you and I talk, right, when we spend a little bit of behind the scenes time, I think what I really appreciate about you is that you think, in my mind, in any case, right. I might have this wrong, but you you tend to think about the game, about cricket, your life, and how you merge those things a little bit differently to other cricketers, you know? And so I think I want to explore a little bit of that with you in this conversation um, around how you think, how you operate um, around certain sort of ideas and topics and things within the game and within performance, um, Yeah, you know? So, so maybe to get us started, right, I, I want to know from you, right, if you could describe your journey and, and how you experienced that. Like if you think of the cricketer you were 10 or whatever years ago and the things maybe that was important to you at that time and the things that you focused on and where, you know, and what sort of shifted and what's changed to where you are now. Oh, what a start, Jules. <laughs> mm. Take a breath away. Yeah. Um, <sighs> I think for me, the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is, I think initially when I just started, I wanted it so, so badly. You know, there's just this deep, deep desire to make it to the top and play high level cricket. And I actually think part of my journey was learning how to stay motivated and work hard enough to get better at the skill, but not push myself to a point of mental exhaustion because I'm trying to chase this, because I'm trying to chase this dream. You know, I, I think where, I think where I sit now, I'm a lot more comfortable in the person that I am rather than trying to use cricket as my identity of who Yas actually is, where cricket in the past was my whole life and who I was. And I think now I know that cricket is just something that is a part of it, you know? <laughs> and I think that kind of change is a lot more settling for me now, I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you said that very succinctly, right? Um, and, and I think a lot of cricketers struggle with this, right? And not just cricketers, human beings in general struggle with this idea that, you know, like how do we define ourselves? I'm always reminded of this thing that what I learned once was when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we think about is ourselves. <clears throat> yeah. Right. And so essentially what you're describing is that you're not just seeking that sense of self in the morning and throughout the day, just in a, just in a game of cricket, but you're also searching for it uh, in other places. Right. And so, if, so, I know what that journey was like for me, right? To disconnect from things, essentially, yeah. to, to disconnect my identity. Like, what, what was that like for you, right? What are, what were some of the major things that you've had to work through, overcome, move past, give up mm -hmm. on potentially 
that to allow you to make that shift? I think what I think realizing that the journey is kind of the most important thing. You know, I, I know it, it sounds it sounds pretty pretty cliche and stuff, but if <laughs> that's all you kind of have is that moment in your journey. Like right now, I would have never imagined myself ten years ago. Um, staying in Oatswood, you know, uh, coming from Job again, have, have played, have played there my whole, you know, initial schooling years and stuff. And, you know, I would, I would have never imagined being here or even have been playing in, in Maritzburg, you know? So I think just the appreciation of the journey and failing along the way, you know, I think that stuff keeps you humble enough to, you know, not try and force too much towards the result, you know, because I think the game of cricket teaches you that that is probably the the last thing that you're in control of is the result, <laughs> you know, and I think like what I mentioned earlier, um, that initial chase early in my career, that initial, like, you know, really burning desire to a point that it was detrimental for me. I think that was that kind of chase there and you know, if you, if you're chasing a, a rabbit will run away, <laughs> you know what I mean? And now it's more a different, different kind of perspective of, I really want to enjoy the journey. You know, I really, and I, th I think I've had this for the last couple of years now, where I've kind of learned to understand that more is that in the cricket environment, every six months, people are changing, you know, you're never going to play with the same amount of players or with exactly the same players for longer than six months. So instead of trying to go and, you know, give it this big I, I, me, me, me thing, I've kind of tried to take the other approach and like really trying to get those people together for that period of time, you know, so that we can do something special for our journey rather than our four of us played for South Africa, for example, you know, not everybody gets, gets that. But yeah. you can still have a great memory by not playing at that level. You know what I'm saying? If you appreciate the journey that you're on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't even know if I said that. <laughs> like, yeah, I no. Right. I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I get sort of the, the gist of what you're saying, right? And, and I think I love what you said there. If you chase a rabbit, <laughs> You know, yeah. if it, 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 it'll, it'll run away. And I think it's the thing that stands out to me about your sort of journey, your story so much is that I remember back when you were under 19, right? Full of hopes, mm -hmm. full of dreams, full of everything that you want. And like any other cricketer at that age, the dream is to go as high as you can. And I, I remember us sort of having a conversation about that. You want to be playing for South Africa by the age of 25. That's sort of clearly imprinted in my in my memory, right? And you've had to watch, you were in that 20, so people might not know this, but you were in the 2014 World Cup winning under 19 team. In other words, Aidan Markram was your captain. Kahisa Robada was your fast bowler. I don't know if there was anybody else from that team that sort of made it, made it into uh, that Dile. stage. Andile. Yeah. Uh, Lungi, a few other guys. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you've, you've had to watch I mean, you had a good World Cup by any stretch of the imagine. You were in the World <laughs> Cup. You were in the World Cup team at the. You know, they selected at the end of the tournament, yeah. and I think that was that's always the thing that was sort of the toughest for me. And I, I know we don't necessarily speak about it often, right? It's not a. It's not like you come and you say, "Hey, Tony, I need to talk about this thing." But I can imagine that that was that's not easy, right? That here you are playing with a whole bunch of people, and you see them go ahead and you also want to go ahead and yet you don't, right? Yet you're, you're, you're staying behind. And I think the thing I appreciate the most out of, out of you and our conversations is how in spite of that, you found, uh, it's like you find your own light, if I can call it that, right? <clears throat> in, in, in as much as it might be tough, right? And as much as it's like a bitter and a hard pill to swallow, cricket's not my identity it doesn't define who I am it's not just about me it's about the people around me. like I think there's a lot to be said about that right and there's a lot to be said about you being willing to walk that path 
right? Sometimes I think our path gets put in front of us, but we're not necessarily open to walking. It. If, if And I mean, I hope I'm not scratching at things here, right? I, I hope oh, no. there's no open wounds and things like that, right? But no, no. Yeah, I mean, but what's the, what was that? What's that like? And how, how did you make sort of sense? Or do you make sense of that now? I think like, yeah, firstly, I, it, it, it is hard. It's really hard, you know, and I think um, understanding that comparing myself to these guys is the worst thing that I can do. And it's something that I continue to do now and something that I've done for a long time in the past. You know, I think there's always some form of comparison or, you know, oh, he made it and I didn't make it or stuff like that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's natural. But I think just by understanding that, I try and, you know, enjoy other people's success. You know, enjoy when my friends are bowling against the best in the world in a test match. You know, I want to be happy for them. I am happy for them, you know. And I think just understanding that my journey is completely different to theirs. I think this is my 11th year of playing professional cricket. In my 11 years, I've played for eight different teams. Some people might be like, oh, why, why can't he hold, hold it down at one tee? Other people might see it as, wow, what a blessing. He's, he's got experience in all conditions. You know what I mean? And if I can use someone like, um, let's say someone from Joburg, like Mitch, Mitch Van, Mitch Van Buren. You know, he has, he's played for one team for a couple of years now. And I think that's great. You know, I mentioned him because I know him and we, we have, we have quite a good relationship, you know, and his growth and his journey will be completely different by staying at a union for X amount of years and being surrounded by certain players and X, Y, Z, you know? So, um, I think, yeah, just understanding that my journey is different and it's not the be all and end all if, you know, someone is better than me, if someone is earning more money from the game, you know, that, that kind of stuff never really, never really bugged me. You know, I've, I've always been someone who, who, um, who wanted to, who wants to be remembered as a workhorse, someone who is good with people, someone who's always like there, you know? Mm -hmm that kind of means more to me than X, Y, Z. You know what I mean? Um, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd love, I'd love a million, like, <laughs> but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the be all in all. Cause I just think getting a little bit older in the game and also having left the game and come back into the game, it really grows my perspective on it. And just understanding that my journey is just, it's just, it's just mine. Eh? Yeah. It's not better or worse than anyone else's. It's just, it's just me. And, what yeah. I can do with my money, yeah, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's freaking awesome, right? So, I mean, that, that I remember that you you mentioned there. I remember that time when you you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? But it was you said that's it. I'm done, right? Uh, basically, yeah, I'm gonna pursue. I'm gonna pursue some stuff elsewhere. I'm gonna get myself overseas, and I'm gonna look to uh, maybe define and walk it walk a little path on the on the flip side of the ocean over there and um i think you spent like six months in the uk uh i think there was some criteria and some things that needed to be met um maybe at least find a job and things like that maybe it didn't all pan out i don't know what happened exactly but i know you came back and you essentially had no contract went back to club cricket and three months later you were playing um division two cricket Three months later, find yourself back in Division One, right? And and so yeah. it's sort of all really changed changed in a hurry. Like, what was that like? What was that like to have to make those tough decisions around sort of looking somewhere else and then knowing that shucks, I've come back to nothing essentially, not nothing, but you know, a lot less than I had if I just decided to stay. Because I actually think you, if I remember correctly, you had another year left on a contract and you gave that up. Yeah, it was a good year. At at SWD, yeah. 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 Oh man, crazy journey that was. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but also like, I think at the time I looked at the options that I had at the time and I felt that that was my best decision to grow. 
you know. Mm. I felt like for the last eight years of playing professional cricket, I haven't made any progress. Those were my feelings at the time, you know. I played at the same level for eight years. I haven't made any progress. What else can I do to forward my career? So now I'm thinking, um, got a good relationship with my club in England. There's some job opportunities there. If I can stay there for an extended period of time, maybe I can play and prolong my cricketing career there. You know, that mm. was my initial thought. X, Y, Z, things happened. A few months later, I was back home. Um, mm. And that was, that was tough. I think coming back home, knowing that I gave up a contract where I was going to play and coming back to that was probably the hardest thing because I kind of lost that identity that I, that I spoke about earlier. I went from being a cricketer, being a cricket coach of uh, under 14 E team at St. Benedict's, you know, that was hard. And I think, um, I owe a lot to Aaron Fisser, Fish, mm -hmm. he helped me through that time. Like no one could ever believe, you know, I trained better during that six months, six month period than I did with any teams that I've been a part of just because of the quality and the work. And I know that's, that's quite a big statement, but the quality and the work that we put in during that time was probably the most prepared and the best prepared I've ever been in my life. And we were just training at St. Benedict's every single day and we'd hit balls and we'd gym and, you know, we'd, we'd make sure that behind the scenes, without the contracts, without those things that we ticking our box, you know, we making sure that we enjoying our journey every day, regardless of if we're having a monetary contract or not. Yeah. Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, I was playing for old Eds. Grant Morgan gave me a call and said, can you run a fitness test? Mm. And I said, yeah, I can pass a 2K. <laughs> and that's how I ended up in Marisburg. <laughs> that's how you are. Who knew, eh? Who knew that it was the fitness test that was going to get you there? <laughs> yeah, like even that, you know, like I, I could have never guessed that I, I would have ended up there. Mm. You know, I could have never guessed that Morgs would have given me that opportunity. You know, I'm so grateful for that. Mm. Um, gave me a chance to start again. You yeah. Know? And um, yeah. yeah man. <laughs> At this and point over, in time, the rest is history. Fitness tests, you know, or like yeah. literally over the fitness test that I ended up there. And it's just, it feels so good to go there at that, or to have gone there at that time. And I was fit and I was prepared mm. and I didn't have to be, you know, I mm. didn't know I was going to get a call a few months later, but I was so prepared mm. that by the time I went to go and play for Inland, I played the, I played the one day comp and I think I played two, two four day games at the end of the season. And I think I finished third highest in the, in the, in the runs for, for one day cricket that season, you know, just because of the work that I did with Aaron, just because I was, so, I was still so switched on. There was something that still, you know, that, that burning desire still in me to, to go and get this thing back. And that's, and that's been, been a massive part of my journey. Other little setbacks, like times where I really had to be strong was like when I had my injuries, I had a meniscus repair on my left knee that was out that took me out for seven months um and i think i was 21 i had a slip disc in my back and that took me out of the game for 10 months so i think like putting those little little hurdles together you know kind of shapes my journey yeah you know and I, I i can't say i'd be any better or any worse without that you yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's who I am. It's what I've experienced. It's, yeah. you know, it doesn't make me better or worse than other people. And I think just that little understanding for me that, you know, that's making me feel a lot calmer about where I am now. It doesn't define mm. me as you better or I'm better. I think that's mm. keeping me sane. <laughs> yeah. You're you, I'm me. Let's go. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Awesome. Tell me. Yeah. Like what, what does that preparation look like? What, what is good preparation or preparation in your mind that has you ready for performance? What is, what is that? 
I think it's an understanding of what I'm going to come up against. So for me, my, my prep will, will look something like this. I'll have a notebook. Actually, I think my notebook's here somewhere. <laughs> um, I'll get to that. So I have a notebook. I know who I'm going to face. Um, so I'll say, okay, these guys have two short left arm bowlers, two tall right arm bowlers. You know, what can I do to prepare for that in the week? So I might get a guy, you know, a really tall guy throwing with the sidearm. I might get a, you know, one of the left, what one of the left handers to to throw at me in the nets, for example. Get the bowling machine on and say, okay, this guy's going to shape the ball in at me. Can I, you know, prep for that? Can I, I know when he bowls that first ball out of his hand in the game, I'm looking to hit mid on if he's going to bowl an in swinger, for example. You know, I think good prep, good prep is a holistic thing. I think it's it's not just oh, I'm going to go face this guy or they have three off spinners now I need to go face off spin in the nets. I think it's a holistic thing, man. You've got to tick the fitness box. You know, you have to be... I think a, a big thing with, with confidence that I've learned is if you're confident in your body, you'll be confident in your in your skill. You know, <clears throat> that's kind of what, what works for me. Um, every time I felt really strong and confident in my body, I've had a better body language. I've, I've, I've played better. I've had a better fuck you attitude. You know, mm. um, that is a massive part of, of the prep. You know, it's the, it's the spiritual behind the scenes things that forms mm -hmm. part of the prep too. That is 90% of the prep. You know, when you walk on that field, you need to be in an acceptance kind of space. You know, I, I know that before I face the first ball of the four day game, if I go out on that first ball, I've done everything that I could to prepare for that. You know, if I go and get a double hundred on that day, I need to accept it the same way as I would getting the first ball if I've prepared well. And that comes from like my meditation. It comes from, you know, how I treat my body, my, my food, alcohol, smoking, all these things that affect us that cricketers don't like really speak about. You know, those things form of a huge part, you know, our recovery. Cricketers don't recover one bit. You know, we'll go gym for five hours and then we won't stretch. You know, it's like we'll gym for five hours and then go have a, a chip roll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like those yeah. little moments is where you kind of, you kind of catch yourself. Man. And I've, I've, I've seen it over the years with the best. Like I look at KG, you know, mm -hmm. that guy is never out of Nick. Mm -hmm. You'll never look at KG and say, fuck me, he's put on a kilo. <laughs> you know um always in tip top shape always prepared always humble and calm and focused you know that doesn't just fall from the sky that guy is doing things at home that is prepping him to show up like that every day yeah you know and i think if you can find out as a person what those little keys are for you then i think you push yourself forward yeah know? yeah I think a lot of my my sense and my understanding is that a lot of people make it about two things. And I, I'm appreciative of, I think this is another reason I appreciate you so much, right? Is, <laughs> is that a lot of people make it about bat and ball and they make it about the gym, All right? And I, and I agree with what you say. They make it only about a part of the gym, you know? Yeah. How fast am I? How strong am I? Um, versus saying... I'd like to think that flexibility, right? To sit down and stretch. There's a link for me between, say, those two and meditation, right? So the, the, the ones who are not open to meditation, which probably is not okay with stretching because it's a similar type of activity, I think, mentally. You've got to sit down on your bum and do work that's mundane. That Yeah, boring. <laughs> you've, got to hold, you've got to hold one position for however long you decide to stretch for. Yeah. Um, it can take an hour out of your day, potentially, you know? And so I think um, it's, if, if I like the way you put it, that it's like holistic, right? That you take care of every part, not just the parts you like, not just the parts you enjoy, not just the parts that are comfortable, right? Um, knowing you and knowing myself, some of the spiritual type of stuff, if you sit down and you meditate a little bit, it's not all easy. It's, it's sometimes wow. it's a struggle. It's not always sure. easy what floats through our minds, right? But the, but we do it because 
we, we know the benefit we get, right? Tell me, so if, if that's preparation, right, where you're looking to take care of everything, well, if, you, if you could describe like a, a time when you played the way you wanted to play, right? When you went out and you did your thing in the way you wanted to do it, and it might not be the 100 or the 200. It might just be like that, that, that was like I was in it, right? We know in cricket you get good balls, right? They get you out. Yeah. Uh, we know sometimes you have a bit of luck on those beginnings, and sometimes we could be batting really well and not have have that sort of little moments go our way, which are out of our control often, right? But if, if you had to like describe a time when you were playing at your best, what is it that you were doing? You now, when I ask that question, is I mean, obviously we can see you walking, we can see you talking, we can see you hitting the ball, but there's normally things to me that batters do behind the scenes like what is it that you're busy with what's your process maybe it's a process if, <laughs> if, 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 if you can take us a little bit through that um that would be great um yeah i think firstly it's a process hey like um it goes back to what i mentioned about the results earlier like if we keep chasing that result or saying i'm, I'm looking for the shot i'm looking for that result you're not present enough to react you know, I've always believed that batting is a reactive thing. You need to be at your most chilled so that you can react to what's coming to you. Bowling's a bit mm. different. It's more proactive. Mm. You know, I think that's why my brain doesn't sometimes get the, <laughs> get the one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, batting, I think you got to find yourself in the most relaxed, reactive kind of space. And for me, we've worked really hard together on my processes over the mm. last few years. And something that I do consciously is um, I count on my fingers while I bat. Mm. This happens between balls. So if I'm facing the ball, I usually have a process saying, give me a bad ball. <laughs> I'm actually looking at the wall like I'm facing the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking at this wall and I'm saying, give me a bad ball, give me a bad ball, give me a bad ball, because I want that to get my mindset strong enough to score. I think that's a big thing as, as, as part of my process um, while that guy is running in. So I want myself to be in my most positive space that if he presents something that I see and I can score off, my instincts must then be in a place to, to take over. And I think saying something and training something like, give me a bad ball, where's my bad ball, watch the ball, you know, stuff like that. I think we've spoken about it in the past. That is part of your performance training. You know, that's your performance processes that you use in a game. Part of my process that I mentioned a bit earlier is my breathing. So when I get to the crease, a lot of the times there's nerves around. All of the times there's nerves around. So my thing is how can I control my breathing as quickly as I can? And for me, it's just a little count in my glove. So if I'm holding my, my, my bat like this, it's just a little one, two, three in, one, two, three out. Just so I could find some rhythm in my breathing. Otherwise, I'm a bit like stuttery, short breaths. And then I don't feel like I'm in a reactive space to produce my skill. So my yeah. between balls time is almost just as important to set me up for my ball that I'm about to face. And I think at times when I've been in that process mindset and completely giving into my process, I've scored a shitload of runs. Being yeah. in that mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, but I don't also, know. like, you don't always get to that mindset, you know? And mm -hmm. I think something that, that that's Stephen Cook taught me many years ago, he said, you can still score runs if you don't feel good. You know, so sometimes those processes are a bit glitchy and things are not all in sync on the day, but you find something that works for you on the day. It's part of your process and you run with that. I think that's uh, how I try and manage my processes at least. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had a thought that's disappeared now. Um, oh, sorry. Got you no, all good. It happens, right? <clears throat> it happens with all of us. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. You'll, you'll enjoy this. My, my latest podcast that's just come out with uh, a sports psychologist from India, Priyanka Prabhakar. Um, she said a beautiful thing in the podcast. Um, she, she spoke about like surrendering to the moment in performance, like bowing down. It's almost like you're honoring the moment rather than, 
rather than just, you know, trying to force and trying to dominate. And, and, I, and, and, and I, I think that sort of you, you speak to that just in a different way, right? You speak to the same idea, the same concept. Um, I haven't read the no, whole, yeah, I haven't read the whole book yet. Right. But, um, mm. uh, there's this book where they, it's about swordmanship. It's, I haven't read the whole book because it's, uh, it twists my brain into knots. I can't even remember the name exactly. The five somethings of swordmanship. And <clears throat> it's sort of, I was put onto this book by a guy who speaks about this idea of mastery, right. And what it means. And how the ancient swordsman was like really looking to master the craft of being a swordsman and not just say, be good enough at something or not just, um, I mean, I, I think the reason for that is in the ancient times, if you, these swordsmen people, as I understand, they fought to the death, right? So if we meet each other, I'm fighting yeah. to the death, right? It's not, it's yeah. not a case. It's not a case of, oh, well, I, I can say, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. We fight until yeah. somebody dies. And so um, life is on the line, literally. <laughs> yeah, your life's on the line, right? And so you cannot yeah. really go in half ass. You, you cannot like just like wing it in there because then you're dead. <clears throat> and so there's this guy, I mean, I'm not good with names and these sort of things, right? I'm, I'm terrible at them. So I can't remember the name of the guy, but he's, if you Google world, world's greatest sword fighter or whatever, I'm sure his name will pop up. I'm sure he's there. Okay. Yeah, he's there because he fought like so many people. He killed so many people. I don't know if it's in the hundreds, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Right? And so this guy was such a master of his craft that towards the end of his career, if you can call it a career, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he fought people with like a wooden sword. Oh, my God. Like he was so skilled at what he does that he felt like he didn't even need the blade anymore. Right. Yeah, he didn't need to do it. <laughs> Yeah. And so like, yeah. if you delve into that a little bit, you'll sort of see that uh, the understanding of mastery, I think more than oh, yeah. more than anything else. Right. And it's and it's about that. It's about the complete surrender to what you're doing rather than trying to say, well, I've got to make runs today or I have to or. And I think even if there's a have to, if we can surrender to the have to. Right. Like we, we sort of give over to like, shucks, this is actually so important. Like I have to do this thing rather than it's driven by a big force behind it, then I think inevitably we, we, we set ourselves free that our performance can naturally just flow. Yeah. No, for sure. I think that's, that's probably the hardest thing in the game, right? Mm. Is like to, to go and enjoy the moment. Mm. Because I think you try so hard day in, day out to get better and to achieve and go out on a Saturday and get runs. And the hardest thing is to have that acceptance before you even get there and say, I've done all that. I've done all that I could. All I can go do is enjoy this. You know, um, I, I had a sense of that when I played in this SAA game against India a couple of months ago, like, I don't know if I'm ever getting that chance again, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I ever going to see that color kit again. So I remember batting there on the, I think we were, we were batting to save the game. And I think I got like 70 not out or something. I was batting there and I was just like, I'm just going to try and soak this up for as long as I can. <laughs> you know, there was chat that we might look to declare T and whatever the case is. I'm like, yo, I'm never getting this chance again, man. I want to bat as long as I can, yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. <laughs> And um, I think that like bit of enjoyment and that, you know, that loving the moment really, I really felt like I loved that moment. Mm. And I think that's exactly what you were, what you were talking mm. like, you know, about now. Yeah. And I so, like, yeah. Yeah. So here's a thought I want to, here's a thought I want to throw to you, right? I remember having a conversation um, now, it was probably two or three years ago. I think it was during COVID. Uh, somewhere, yeah. maybe just before I had a chat with a, another first class cricketer and I remember asking him to tell me about when he was at his best, right? It's one of my favorite questions I like asking people because I think in the answer of that question, as we pull out the details of it, right, we can discover 
Like, what is it that actually has us performing at our best, right? And then we can do more effort to try and cultivate that or breed that in our day-to-day -day stuff, right? And so I think what this cricketer said to me was he was on holiday. So I imagine if you're on holiday, you're having a whale of a time, no care in yeah. the world, chilled out, uh, which he essentially said. Like uh, He wasn't like stressing about cricket or his career or anything like that. He was literally just on holiday, having a chill, got a phone call to say, hey, we've got a... We've got like a warm up game. And at that time, he was sort of young, not in the system yet. All right, we've got this opportunity. We're looking for some players. Can you come? He said, Sweet, I'm in. I'm coming. <clears throat> Scored a double hundred. Like, wow. You know? Yeah. And so I said to him, So, how often do you go on holiday before you play? And right? how often do you do that? If that's like a key ingredient. Yeah. In you performing at your best, you completely having a chill out. And he's like, I never do that. And I'm like, well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because we, yeah. it's, it's, it's like I'm <laughs> on a holiday now. And, 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 and which high performance environment in the world would encourage a cricketer? I'm not saying go on holiday as in go book a hotel and go to the beach. But I mean, you can cultivate the holiday feeling or the holiday experience. Maybe yeah. it just means in the days before a game, instead of standing in the nets and hitting a gazillion balls, feeling yeah. like, oh, I've got to switch on, I've got to switch on, and you bring that level of intensity, maybe that works for some. But for him, it was a case of, okay, well, how do I actually tone down? And how do I chill out? And how do I space out? And how do I create more time in my day? And how do I, you know, how do I, how do I get more, um, more into like a relaxed state? One, two, ready for the opportunity. And three, then go out there and actually play. You know, like just do your thing with less of that pressure and stress of I have to, I must, and sort of the focus on the outcome more just, oh, wow, here's another opportunity to play. And so I think, I don't know how much of that he's doing currently, right? But, but I think my perception is that not enough athletes do a lot of effort to understand how they get to be at their best. Not enough athletes do that. And they tend to follow the coach which isn't net wrong, right? Because the coach is sort of the one running the ship. But I'd like to think that if you're an elite athlete, you have the right to go to the coach and sort of say, hey, coach, I know this works for me, actually. And you might have to prove it to the new coach. You might have to show that that's what works. But I think if you find something that really works for you, then we should do more effort to actually commit to doing that, you know, rather than, do things that aren't that good for you. Although it might seem to the outside world like, yeah, you're busy doing the right thing. You know, you're out there, you're hitting balls, you're focused, you're making your positions, you're keeping your shapes, you're <clears throat> working on your contact points before the game, whatever it might be, right? That you rather say, hang on, I know what gets the best out of me. Yeah. What gets the best out of me is going on holiday. <laughs> I need two yeah. days before every game and maybe sure. the challenge gets to a T20 you've, where you've got to find a way to... to <laughs> afternoon to, fishing. <laughs> afternoon fishing, right? Like, why not? If that's if that's the vibe, well, well, coach, peace out. I'm going to go catch my fish, get my mind off things here, throw my line, do my chill time, and I know I'm good to go tomorrow because I've, I've done the work that's necessary for me. <laughs> yeah, um, so important. And I've, I've had this thought a lot in my, in my career also. Hmm. But I also... I don't understand at what at what point does that kind of process like I, I don't know how to say this at what point that do you change it when it doesn't work does it make sense so imagine Tom is going on holiday and he's absolutely bashing run <laughs> <laughs> and then Tom keeps keep keeps going on holiday and he goes through an enormous step and at what stage does Tom say no I'm not gonna go on holiday every day I'll actually do way more <laughs> you I know that's my course. kind of thing <clears throat> yeah I've kind of found that with my processes in the past like I find something that works for a period of time mm. but then at other times it doesn't work and then I don't really know what to do <laughs> yeah so I think the important thing is and and, and I and I appreciate you for raising that right because Yes, that's how it could be. That's how it could seem. Well, this guy's just going on holiday all the time and he's not performing. 
And so I think the understanding there isn't necessarily even that you've got to go on physical holiday. It might just mean that while I hit balls before a game, I get into a holiday feel with the hitting of the balls, yeah. right? If that makes sense. I'm, I'm just... So it's the understanding of more, you would know this language, but it's cultivating mm -hmm. the state of the holiday, not necessarily the holiday itself. I actually the holiday... had this thing. <laughs> so yeah. No, it's fine. I, I had this thing a couple of years ago where yeah. all the all the three day games and four day games used to start on a on a Thursday. So mm. every Wednesday after our top up, I used to go have chicken leg, mm. and I needed like that was my I needed six wings and a soul fire sauce, and I used to sit there with my back full of chicken <laughs> and just chill out, and then go play the next day, and I always had a great time. <laughs> So maybe I need to revisit this. <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I, uh, it could be in something like food, right? You're anchoring in an experience. You're saying, well, mm. okay, every, every game before the time, I'm going to have my moment. And that almost like just sets me up. Mm. I don't know if chicken licking is the best thing, right? Like, we're talking all <laughs> this talk about fitness and being holistic, and now we're throwing yeah, chicken wings. Yeah, chicken licking before the game. Right. Yeah, you run it off on Monday, eh? <laughs> After the game. <laughs> But I think that, so that, that's more the important part, I think, to recognize here is that it's the cultivating of the state or the triggering of the state or the awakening of the state, whatever, whatever the best words would be there. That I think that's the, the key. And I don't know if enough people do effort with that. I mean, I, I had a, a lady on the podcast, uh, Alex Krupp, who's a Cirque du Soleil gymnast. And she had a, uh, she, at one point in time, she spoke about the food she eats on performance days. Okay. Cause she, they do 10 shows in a week, every week. She has off days, but on her performance days, she eats very specific food. Okay. She, she eats food that makes her stomach not uncomfortable because she doesn't like to have the experience. And I mean, she's up in the air swinging on the ropes and like doing all oh. this fancy stuff. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and so she's what she explained in the video was uh, in the podcast was um, that she doesn't want to be up in the air, worried or having to place her focus on her stomach. She knows what that feels like. And she doesn't like that experience that I'm yeah, in the air doing all these things. And I should be worried about my facial expressions and putting yeah. on a show. But now my attention is in my stomach. All right. And so I think that's the. Oh, yeah. And like I, I said to her, like, I think that's brilliant to know and understand that about yourself. And she sort of made the comment that, well, her colleagues think she's crazy. <laughs> I was like, no, I think that's, I think more people must do that and understand that about themselves. So like this cricketer, as an example, who knows that he's, he's, he almost needs to chill out before performance. Well, okay. How do I create that experience? How do I, how do I, how do I switch that on before performances? And yeah, maybe I need to get like so good at it that, I can do it in 10 minutes, you know, I can just like completely decompress for 10 minutes and I'm good to go. Like if you could do that, wow. <laughs> right. Maybe it doesn't need to be a whole holiday. Maybe initially it might take you three days and then it takes you two days and then it takes you one day and then you can get it like down to half a day. Yeah, but just like, I, I think just like people practice their cover drive and they practice their cover drive and their cover drive. And when they were young, they could hardly hit the ball and now they're scoring. Now they hardly miss it. I think there's a missing component that we must spend more time with understanding what we want the experience to be like. How am I when I'm at my best and sort of cultivate more of that? And I agree yeah. with you. I just want to make one more comment. Here. I agree with you that processes can have this effect, right? That we can find something and it works and it only works for a period of time. And then we might have to not necessarily re-engineer, but bring freshness to our mind so that if, if the experience I want is to be relaxed, well, maybe, maybe uh, I can use fishing for a period of time and then I might need to use the chicken licking and then I might need to use a conversation with my girlfriend or I might use to sort of go sit on the beach Yes, because I think our minds get bored too quickly. It's a built in oh, yeah. thing in the human brain, right? If you just give it the same thing, it starts finding it boring and you actually lose the effect of it. So, mm -hmm. The routine isn't necessarily in eating the chicken licking. It's in creating the experience. And so yes. if I can have a couple of things that help me create the experience, then I can keep it fresh. 
So maybe understanding that if I spend time with certain individuals, well, then that relaxes me. So maybe every other week I spend that time with them. Maybe every other yes. week I eat the chicken licken. Every other week I go for fishing. Mm -hmm. And so I've got multiple things that can provide me with creating the same experience. So I'm not relying on one. I'm using different so, things. <clears throat> I'm, I'm keeping it fresh, but I'm still creating a similar experience for myself. I'm, I'm turning on a similar state. And then in doing that, I can... I can be more in my best place when I go into performance. Oh, that's so amazing, man. It's like, it's, made, it's actually made me think about your cold plunge that you... Oh, yeah. I haven't, had one, <laughs> I haven't know, had one in a while. I haven't had one in a while. It's like, you'll know that that works for you because it triggers something in you. You know? Yeah. Fear. Like, I, like <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to picture it like, if I'm trying to play well under pressure in a cricket game how do i know or how can i simulate that pressure when i'm not even at cricket you know i think things like a cold plunge like what like what like what you do that moment when you're standing there and you're about to jump in that in that water it's the same moment as it, it's it's like the same oh what's the word man like breathless feeling when you're under pressure in a game. Same know? decision making is how I would describe yes. it. It's, yes. it's the same kind of moment, mm. you know? And I think like doing the plunge will make you better at that moment because you, you create in the, the uncomfortable place and then the state to go into that uncomfortable place. Yes. Does that make sense? So I 100%. think- 100%, so well said. <laughs> <laughs> so well said. Yeah, my brain is buffering today. Um, but yeah, I, I think I want to incorporate a bit more of that into my, into my cricket and my life, like, you know, um, create things that will help me, you know, create like little fun pressure things that help me when the heat's on, mm. you know, I think that's important because yeah. it becomes a part of your DNA. It's not just, oh my God, we're dealing with some pressure today. It's like, no, I deal with the pressure every day, mm. you know, yeah. and it's just like, so yeah, I'm sure yeah. we'll have you know, countless chats allowed to access that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, the, the bay's not far away from you. There's, uh -uh. A, there's, there's enough cold water there for everyone, eh? Nice, and I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just do it. I tell I'll you, send you so, a video. Yeah, please do. So, so the, the, the thing <laughs> with the cold water, right? I hate it. Like 100%. It's not, I don't like it one bit. My wife loves it. And oh, I think God. my son might be somewhere in between, right? Um, but normally when we get to the water, my wife goes first or my son jumps in first. And I stand on the side there and I have to really convince myself. <laughs> the wind blows a bit. It's Yo. cold. It's in the winter. In the summer, the water at least heats up a little bit. But we, we do it in the winter. You go stand on that water, you look at it, it's beautiful. Normally, weirdly enough, the winter water there is always crystal clear. You see the fish swim there. Maybe the sun's just shining a little bit. And then it is like this big convincing process, right? It is this big thing. It's like, am I actually up for this? Like, am I actually yeah. going to do this today? And, and it's weird because it's every day. Every single time we get there, it's a similar. I never get to that water and say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to jump in today. Yeah. Like my first question when my son jumps in is normally like, how is it? He's like, no, it's cold. I'm like, oh, fuck. like really? <laughs> and they've got these poker faces, right? So they can no. jump in and like, just keep a straight face. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's stretching every boundary on me. Right. It's just pulling me apart. Like, into... yeah. but then eventually, and I'm not the kind to like take, go in the water and put my toes in there and like, Pat it yeah. on me because that just freaks me out, right? I just stand there and I stand there and I stand there until I'm sort of ready. You've got to make the decision, man. Eh? Yeah, until I'm ready. And I know we've decided to swim. So I know I'll get there and I just event and then I get to a place where I just go, okay, cool. Kind of like, yeah. fuck it, here we go. Right? And then I and then I take my dive and it's cold and then the burning comes and the fingers go numb and the toes go numb because it's never just for like five minutes or something like that. We stay in that water for. 20, 20, 30 minutes, you know, so it's, 
you, you climb out and you can't walk on your feet because they feel dead kind of thing. I don't know if that's good, right? I, that's debatable. No, I'm not saying anybody should want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having said that, it wasn't like that the first time, right? The first time was like two minutes and I was out of there. So it was a slow process over three years to build up the tolerance. But even yeah. though the tolerance is there, right? It is, the, the start is always the same. It's that it's a struggle. It's a mental battle to oh, yeah. just get in the water. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you get to a place where you enjoy it, right? You're swimming around there and it's like, okay. And then I normally get up when my body starts shivering, when like the shivers kick in, where it just, yeah. okay. It's, and it's uncontrollable. My jaw starts bouncing around. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Now I know. <laughs> it's go time. Had yeah. no <laughs> and then my wife will still be like floating in there like a butterfly, like oh, oh, living, living, the, living the good life. <laughs> yeah. I think that's yeah. so important that you mentioned there, Jones. Mm. Just one more thing before we finish. Yeah. I, I was I was watching a bit of a test match yesterday and I was listening to Sangakara speak and mm. he was speaking a bit about the West Indian batters and you know they they let they they left well and you know they played nice and late and whatever, whatever. But he he mentioned something where he said they'll need to come together in the dressing room and make a decision on what mm. their options are to score. Mm. You know? eventually you make the choice i'm going to jump mm. in that water mm. you know eventually you make the choice where i'm going to spin this ball out of my hand now mm. you know and i think that like that moment is such a powerful moment you know you make mm. a choice to follow the process and believe in that process that you've trained mm. you know, i think that's that's what training is you know, i was speaking to one of this one of one of the little guys here his name is keenan um good little left hand uh player and we were just like, oh, I actually lost my, lost my train of thought a little bit, but like, what's your, what's the decision your decision to score? Yeah. yeah. The decision you know, to score. Decision. What's your decisions you're making to score? Your decision mm. to score. You, know, yeah. you can decide to defend. You can decide to go and score. And I think that's like things that I, I really need to work on. It's just making that tough decision sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Well, we all got we all got growth to do. We all got more work to do. We all got to oh, yeah. up our game in different ways. Yeah, yes, this has been fun. Eh? I've enjoyed I've enjoyed oh, catching up with you. Firstly, and secondly, oh, I've enjoyed oh, yeah. sort of every every little bit of yourself you've thrown into this conversation. Um, I know you've got a preseason coming up and a little bit of winter work before the mm -hmm. next season kicks in. So I, I'm appreciative of you. You know sending me a little bit of your time and um hopefully we'll hopefully we'll catch up again soon no oh, joe it's oh you know amazing as ever um mm. thank you so so much always enjoy our conversations it's and fine. um yeah thank you for allowing me to be on the podcast can't oh, wait fine. to can't wait to do it again <laughs> yeah that's, we, we can definitely do it we can definitely do oh, it at some sure. time cool for sure. awesome thanks yes awesome. have thank a great you so day much, cool, man. Have a